not a ton to talk about, right? <laughs> <laughs> not much has happened what's happened this year, but we're gonna we're gonna cover it and we'll share a little of why some of the things happened the way they did and uh, I think more than anything else, why some early year sort of predictions or uh, forecasts were uh, missed by quite a bit. <laughs> so we, we do this presentation twice a year. We do January Outlook. And then even though this says Outlook, we typically call this our halftime report uh, to give an update as to how things uh, transpired over the previous six months and what we look ahead in the next six months in the next year. Um, so we're going to take a quick look at what we presented in January because I think it's fair to share those numbers and not hide from them. Because we could easily hide. So we get these presentations from LPL Research. They have a huge team uh, of economists that put this stuff together. They send us daily market reports, so we're, we're getting data from them every day. We also have a number of investment partners that during the course of a year we get a lot of information from uh, related to all this type of material. But these were the numbers, so at the end of 21, these were the uh, GDP growth numbers, they're not the forecasted numbers. This is where the year ended for 2021. So the U.S. economy grew 5.5% in 21. These numbers down here are the range where the year started, where the year ended in 21. So quite a huge jump uh, through much of the second half is where inflation jumped last year. Uh, through just about that entire period we heard it was transition uh, or transitionary. Uh, or trans transitory. transitory. <laughs> uh, we now know that. It's really transitionary now. <laughs> Um, unemployment moved in the right direction. The Treasury yield actually it, it went in this range through the course of the year, actually ended the year at around 1.5. This is what was forecasted in January for 2022. Uh, so there was a belief that growth would slow down, uh, not to the point where had a negative first quarter and probably a flat second quarter. We still have a chance to get some growth this year. You'll see those numbers later uh, in the presentation where we think it will end up after knowing what we know. <laughs> the thought was this on inflation. So that was a big miss. Somewhere between four and five percent down from seven, right? Point the opposite direction, obviously, which is a huge cause of everything seen, particularly in the second quarter. This was a huge issue as well. So the 10-year Treasury yield <coughs> was predicted to be in that range for the course of this year. It spiked, I don't remember the date, you guys might remember, but it went from 1.5 to 3.6 in a very short period of time. And when you get that type of spike in the 10-year Treasury yield, value of stocks is driven down significantly. So I think it happened in April because the second quarter was where a huge part of the losses occurred. Um, so these were the two big misses. This actually hit unemployment, uh, which is why the administration takes credit for that. Right? It's the only thing they can. <laughs> um, so you see those numbers. These were the other numbers, which is uh, earnings on the S&P uh, index. And this we took back a few more years. Again, this was from our January presentation. So you saw that big dip in 2020 related to COVID. Big jump forward in 21. And the prediction was this. So this is actually a positive thing. Because as we sit here today, the earnings forecast is still around 220 for the S&P 500 for this year. That means corporate world, the business environment is still fairly strong to support earnings growth, which could be a driver in the second half of the year to push the stock market back up, push the S&P back up. Um, this was the fair value of the S&P in January. The thought was if treasuries 
stayed in that 10 year treasury yield stayed in that 1.75 to 2 range, the value of the SP would be 5,000. We're nowhere near that. <laughs> and that's because the treasury yield spiked so much. Um, and then the earnings we talked about. So I'm going to spend some dollars in this section, and then we'll go into the forecast beyond this. Um, this is what bonds have done this year. Okay? So traditionally, bonds are our downside bucket. Does this look like a bucket of the downside? <laughs> And the, and the spike in yields had a lot to do with that. Plus, when the Fed came into the year, they said, yeah, maybe four interest rate hikes, 25 each. It quickly went up to 50 basis points to 75. We're going to get another 75, maybe even 100. That changed this whole dynamic pretty early on. So they didn't serve as a buffer. So if you had a 60-40 portfolio, 40% was in alternatives. And bonds, you lost 10% of the bonds. To give you a perspective on that, there's only been four years where the bonds, since 1980, where bonds have had a negative return a year, 12 months. Four uh, since 1980. One was last year, it was down 1.5%. The worst year was 1992, it was down 2.9%. So that's unprecedented. And it's many factors, but uh, it hurts when you can't get a you know, buffer on your portfolio, which is why we put bonds in those portfolios. This is just another picture of what drove that, right? Um, the blue line is treasury yields. It was at 3.3 .3 on June 16th, that spike up, versus the uh, real yield because of inflation. We're underwater. Huge driver, negative real yield of driving those, those bond values down. Uh, so inflation had a lot to do with it as well as the impact on the trigger. <clears throat> this is what stocks do to the S&P. That's not the least actually. <laughs> so, you know, five and a half quarters not unprecedented at all, but 16.4 down is. So is the market glass half full? So if you go back in time and you look at every quarter where there's been a 15% plus down market for the quarter, the next quarter after that, seven out of eight times was positive. And the average positive growth was 6.2%. Next six months after that negative quarter, eight out of eight times in the next six months were positive, with an average of plus 15. The next 12 months, eight of eight, plus 26. So we think there's a possibility based on history when you have that type of downturn for a quarter, that we got some room to grow here over the next three, six, 12 months. Um, here's another look at it. You have a six month period. So we lost over 20% over the first half of the year. That's happened before. Previous times it's happened, the next quarter was positive seven out of seven. <clears throat> With a plus eight and a half, six months plus 21, year plus 31. So this is more optimistic than the previous one. Obviously, none of these pluses are guarantees. But it's, it's good trends to know that it's happened before, and this is what's happened after. Um, and we're positive that the, that the market, things that we see in the market and the data we get, support uh, this growth. So this is another one. These are the last two slides. So this is a chart of U.S. consumer confidence going back to the 70s. So we don't need to look back. It's for the low. It's at the lowest point it's ever been since 1970. Even worse than 1980 when interest rates were 16 percent. Even worse than 2008, 2009. Uh, the 
the Europeans aren't too confident either. <laughs> right? It's not quite as bad as COVID, but it's getting there. It's close. Uh, I show you this because the consumer is typically almost always wrong. <laughs> and uh, who knows what Warren Buffett's been doing the last three months? Well, we do now. So he said, he's uh, asking for uh, He's buying. Yeah. He's buying stocks. And it's his quote, right? When when uh, the when investors are greedy, be fearful. When investors are fearful, be greedy. That ties right into. Investors are fearful, the confidence isn't there. It's a good time to buy. Typically it is. Doesn't mean you go whole hog in, but it's a good time to get money that's sidelined back in. Um, so there's really good positive trends that, that we see. Um, we'll share some uh, forecasted numbers. Tom's going to get the economy, and then Shane will finish up with some market stuff. And, uh, so we do think growth is going to slow down uh, the second half of the year, and, but we don't think we're going into a recession. And we think uh, the economy is going to slow down because there, there are persistent inflationary you know, uh, problems out there right now. Um, you know, inflation came in in June at 9.1%. Uh, I think it's the highest inflation rate ever, maybe, in the United States. Um, and you know, to Chuck's point, uh, that that 21% down for the stock market was the worst first six months to a year since 1970. So that, that's a pretty bad beginning of the year, amplified by bonds being down, you know, close to 10%, which is I think the worst first six months ever in the history of the bond market. But but there is room for optimism, and long term, you know, another one. Famous Warren Buffett saying is don't bet against the United States uh, and don't bet against corporate you know, America. They, they tend to be resilient and our economy tends to be resilient and earnings from corporations tend to tend to go up over long periods of time and it takes stocks with them. So we're pretty confident that will happen again. I can't tell you exactly when, but uh, hopefully we'll have a turnaround in the not too distant future. So. Uh, yeah, so, but we think part of the reason why that the economy will not go into a recession this year is that the consumer is still very strong in, in the United States. And some of the slides I'm going to show you will point out why the consumer is so strong right now. So we think consumer spending will, will keep things chugging along, although at a slower pace. Uh, and particularly wealthier Americans have, have a lot of money uh, right now. And somebody I was talking with earlier, it was Jeanette, and we were talking about, yeah, the, the wealthy haven't slowed down their spending at all, and if anything, they've increased it. So uh, so those are some of the reasons why we think uh, we will not go into a recession this year. I know every, everybody out there, you're hearing that word, a recession word everywhere. So, and, and that makes people fearful. And even if a recession does come, which it will, we have business cycles. The business cycles aren't going to stop. Uh, a recession will come, you know, we think it will be fairly mild and, and, and a shallow recession. So, um, so here we're just looking at, uh, just to piggyback off on some of the slides that Chuck had shown you, uh, just some of our updated forecasts uh, versus what we had, you know, forecast at the beginning of the year. So, uh, in 22, we think that uh, Gross domestic product, you know, the value of all goods and services provided by the United States will uh, come in somewhere between 1.9 to 2.5 percent, probably right around the 2 percent range. Um, but we think it's going to slow down, and next year, somewhere, slow down even further, somewhere in the 1.3 to 1.9 percent range. And you know, I won't bore you with reading all the others, but you can see the Eurozone. Generally, emerging markets have. Uh, Emerging markets are company, you know, countries like Brazil, uh, China, uh, Mexico, the, the emerging economies. Uh, they they may grow at a little bit more rapid pace than the United States. We're an established economy, and, and they, they have a lot more room for growth. So uh, you can see them all, and the global sort of just adds them all together. And you know, we're projecting globally uh, growth to be somewhere in the two and a half to three, three point one percent range this year. 
next year is slowing down uh, a little bit. Well, actually, we have an increasing up, uh, and that's being bought up by the emerging markets, uh, somewhere in the 2.8 to 3.4 percent range. Uh, inflation, and this is the big thing that you know, everybody's talking about now, and everybody's worried about, and, and rightfully so. Inflation is a killer. I mean, it, it eats into your spendable income big time, and, and eats into your lifestyle. Uh, but um, we think when all said and done, as I mentioned, June came in at 9.1. Uh, we think when the year is out, it's going to settle in somewhere around 6.6 to 7.2. So it's going to come down, but it's going to be slow. Frankly, slow, and this is not transitory. You know, some of this is going to stick around. Uh, the Fed would like inflation. The Fed, Federal Reserve would like inflation to be at two percent. Uh, that we don't think that's happening for a while. Even next year, uh, you know, we see it coming in somewhere between three point five and four point one percent. It's going to be slow coming down, and it's going to take a number of years for the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve sort of has a dual mandate: uh, inflate, control inflation. And their target is, is 2%, and their other mandate is to keep employment, you know, full employment. You know, I just read this morning, U.S. home sales dropped 5.4% in June. Um, so that's the first pullback in home sales in, in years, uh, in a long time. So those higher interest rates are impact, impacting sales already. And you can see uh, on the inflation front, uh, you know, Eurozone, Pretty similar to the United States, um, you know, they're, they're suffering through the same things that we're, we're suffering through. And globally, uh, you know, we think this year, very close to the United States, coming in at 6.5 to 7.1 percent, and next year, 3.9 to 4.5 percent. But uh, what, what we're showing here, and again, this is some of the reasoning why we're thinking what we're thinking. Um, this blue uh, bar, bar graph here. This is debt to service ratio, so for an average American. And in other words, they're comparing your income to your debt services. So principal and interest on your mortgages, or if you have like a home equity loan, line of credit, credit cards, uh, car loans, you know, those types of things. So you can see if we go back, I, I call this the Great Recession in 07, uh, you can see the average American took about you know, 13% of their income was going to debt service. Uh, and then what happened? It just kept coming down, 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 which is a very good thing. That, that means people are saving that in general. They're either, well, they're not spending, but generally saving that money. And savings has gone up in this country. Kept going down, down, down. And then what do you think happened here? <laughs> COVID. So COVID hit, and some people lost it. A lot of people in. You know, it depended on the industry you were in, but if you were you know, a waiter or on a, working on a cruise ship or in the airlines, you didn't have money coming in anymore. So people started borrowing again. You can see borrowing has been ticking up, but still nowhere near you know, the 13% uh, that it was back in 07. It's somewhere around 8 or 9% today. Uh, this is a little bit more complex. This is called the financial obligations ratio. This is looking at individual consumers after tax income and adding in other things that this doesn't add in. So it adds in uh, lease payments on your car, if you rent, if it's adding in your rent, if, if you own rental properties, it's adding in your rental income, uh, and, and things like that. So um, it's probably a little bit better picture of really what the debt Americans are you know, experiencing. Yes? Is the forgiveness of student loan debt going to show up on this anywhere? Well, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so, yeah, in some ways, it, it, would it show up on this? Yeah, it, it definitely. It would bring this. It would bring this down, you know, a little bit if it were to happen. It would bring both numbers down. What's that? It would yeah, it would be. It would bring both both numbers down. Yeah, absolutely. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, if that happens or not. I mean, I I, I know the Biden administration is pushing for it, so we'll, we'll see. But I, I don't think it's going to be as grandiose as they had originally hoped for. They're not going to forgive all student debt, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see five, ten thousand dollars forgiven, some, something like that. Uh, so yeah, it has been taking up a little bit again since COVID, but still, still uh, pretty good by historical standards. And the thing that's really encouraging, I mentioned a lot of this you know, lowering of debt that the individual consumer has in our country. A lot of it went to savings, and during this COVID period. Uh, 
Americans build up over three trillion dollars in savings during that period, plus what was already saved, which was around 1.2 trillion. So there's like about 4.0 trillion dollars, trillion of savings that America, you and I all, you know, all have today. That's a lot of uh, pent up demand and power that uh, people are going to want to spend. And that's part of the reason why, that's what this slide is all about, that you know, we don't think the recession is coming right away because the consumer is still pretty strong. So what we're looking at here is uh, with the yellow, the orange line is manufacturing backlog. In other words, a lot of big problem that you and I have been having and a lot of companies have been having, having you order a refrigerator. And yeah, good luck if it comes in three months. There's a lot of backlog order orders going on on the manufacturing side, which is the ISM and uh, the ISM manufacturing, and then they also look at services. Services, you know, um, architects, uh, financial advisors, uh, law, those types of things. You can see that we have started uh, just probably about a year ago. The backlogs are actually loosening up, and, and not many people know that. But I think we all saw in the news, like you saw out in, in Long Beach and, and LA, there were, there were like well over 100 ships just anchored out there waiting to unload their stuff. And from what I understand now, it's down to about 40 ships in each port. So slowly but surely, yeah, John. And, and just look where the manufacturing went, the orange line is one point. Yeah, right, right. It takes right. a long time to chip away at that backlog when it went all the way down to where it did. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that that map is just brutal, and uh, so so in any event, it, the backlines are starting to get get a little bit better, and uh, that that's a very encouraging sign. This, this is something we call the uh, uh, Fed supply chain pressure index, or in, in versus the uh, CPI, which is uh, you know inflation basically, and you can see what's been going on here, and it ties in with the previous slide. Is that um, you know CPI has gone way up, and they almost mirror each other. So the Fed supply uh, chain pressure index is when it's up this high, it means there's a lot of pressure on the supply chain, and it's starting to ease also. But there's generally about a four-month lag from the time when things start to loosen up until you actually see the inflation numbers come down. So we think we're in that period now. And I can tell you, everybody thinks just everything is still going up. And that's not the case. I mean, certain things are starting to come down in prices now. And, and for instance, lumber. Lumber's down 40% uh, year to date. Well, lumber's a big thing. It goes down. Commodities are down. Copper, uh, a lot of commodities are down, or have come down uh, pretty dramatically in, in uh, cost. Uh, used cars have come, come down. Uh, used cars were already almost going for when a new car went uh, at a certain period there. Uh, they're coming down. Uh, the shipping costs for container ships and for shipping via trucks uh, in our country are starting to come down pretty nicely. So there are some encouraging signs that inflation is going to come down, but it, it's going to be slow. Uh, you know, as long, as long as those energy prices are as high as they are you know, right now. Which even those are starting to come back. And, uh, gas prices uh, across the country have dropped 36 days in a row. Uh, that, that, that's pretty pretty amazing. Now it hasn't been a lot. It's been a penny here. <laughs> <laughs> it goes up five ten cents a pop, uh, but it comes down a penny, two pennies a day. But we've had 36 days in a row where gas prices have dropped. So um, so encouraging sign that inflation will hopefully ease up a little bit here. And we think if we get you know a couple. Of, you know, improvements on the inflation side, and if, God willing, you know, the Ukraine-Russia uh, thing could, could come with some kind of settlement, you know, you really could see a nice pop-up. So I'm turn it over to Shane. I have nothing to talk about. Um, <laughs> this is a problem being the anchor man in this class, and not practicing with them, basically when you're funny as you talk. Um, I'll talk about the stock and bond market. So we talked about, we think the stock market is ready for a recovery. Let's talk about why. Well, first off, why is it dropped? I think we've covered made a good case. Inflation's good in the story. Inflation this year, with a spike at 7%, we come into 2022 
In January, we had a 7% number on inflation in December, we shocked everybody. Now we're concerned that uh, Powell's not going to raise interest rates fast enough to fight it. We think he's not going to be quick enough to react. The market drops. Then we found the Fed is going to raise rates, so the market stabilizes a little bit. Right? Like the morale a little bit. Okay, we're not going to, this is going to be a big drop. Then we get the war in Eastern Europe. The market drops again. Two biggest factors in inflation right now energy prices and supply chain. So in May, we got an inflation number of 8.6%. Of that 8.6%, Moody's is estimating 5.5% of that was purely because of energy prices and supply chain issues. You take those two things out, which we clearly can't do. But you take those things out, we're down 3.5% inflation, which is manageable. 8.6, 9.1, that's a shock to the system. The market reacts very negatively. We get the inflation number for June, which came out earlier in July. Yeah, 9.1%. Um, so 8.6 and 9.1. So we still not hit a peak point. We still have not stabilized. It's sort of coming down. Why do we think we, inflation is going to start coming down? One, energy prices. We just said, Tom mentioned 30, we just said 36 days, days of gas prices down. coming down. Energy in the form of uh, crude oil, $125 a barrel. In mid June, it's now under $95 a barrel. Um, that drop was not reflected in the inflation numbers for June, but it will be for July. Supply chain, just last month we got our first report where inventories are actually going up. Now, normally, from an economic perspective, we see a report saying inventories are rising, that's concerning. Which usually means that consumers not buying as much, so inventories are starting to build, build up. In this case, it doesn't mean that. It means we're finally starting to work our way through the supply chain issues, and stores are starting to get driven towards built back up. So as long as the consumer can stay strong, and as long as the job market can stay strong, we don't think we're headed for a recession. There's really no textbook definition of recession, but generally accepted it's two or more quarters of negative GDP growth, coupled with rising unemployment. We've had very strong unemployment. So as long as corporate America doesn't start laying off mass or having mass layoffs, we don't think we're headed to a recession anytime soon. Okay? If you don't have a recession, but have a bear market, bear market is uh, stock price drop of 20% or more. So anytime you have a bear market and it's not coupled with a recession, the average drop is about 21.5%. From the very peak, which is pretty much New Year's Day, to June 27, 2022, the stock market was down 23, 8 point, I think it was 23.4%. So just very slightly larger than the typical average bear market that we have that's not tied to recession. That's okay. The good news is when that happens, no recession, bear market, from the time it hits its bottom, for the next 12 months, on average, the market is up 15.5%. Yeah, so that's, that's what we're looking at now. Obviously, if you look at the numbers that we had in, I think it was your very first slide, Chuck, where we thought the S&P was going to be fair value, somewhere between 5,000 and 5,100 by year end. Obviously, LPL Research has to uh, amend that number. We're now looking at 43 to 4,400. Let's put that in context long enough. When they start prepping these reports, they start doing all the research and, and it in early June, and then they finalize it at the very end of June, and they use June 27th data to come up with these numbers, which was basically the bottom of the market. June 27th market, S&P was about 3,700, and they thought we would go from 3,700 to 43, 4,400. It'd be about an eight and a half percent move. Uh, as of today, the market's at 3,999.98. <laughs> we'll call it 4,000. So we're already at 4,000 uh, with roughly a 5% move from off the bottom to where we are today. That would put a early up. And then the second thing was in Chuck's early slide, we were expecting, or excuse me, LPL Research was expecting the SP 500 earnings per share to be at $220 by the end of this year. They actually increased the rest of it to 225 that puts us at about a 19 earnings per share ratio, which is historically average for where we are right now. So this is very, very doable. 
In fact, they might have dropped them too much, seeing how we can go in the next 30 days. Now, we are not prepared to say we sold the bottom of the market. We may retest that bottom. So things like a surprising July inflation number will absolutely test that bottom. But we don't think from where that bottom was, there's much further to go down. Could it? Absolutely. But the only the information we know right now, we think we're in pretty good shape where we're sitting today. Next year, we're expecting earnings per share at $235. So let me just do some quick math for you. Use the um, same 19 or earnings per share. I guess the stock market around 44 to 4500. 2023. There's a lot more things out there right now that feel bullish about the bearish. You know, from a consumer sentiment standpoint, it doesn't feel that way. From an economic and a fiscal standpoint, there are definitely more positives out there right now than there are negatives. So about the bond market. Chuck already alluded to, as bad as it's been for the stock market, and we all see it in the news every day, it's been a historically bad bond market. Stock market, we're now 23% from the peak to the drop. That's the typical bear market. This is a historically bad market for bonds. Um, so bad that there was nowhere to hide. You invest in stocks, you were down. You invest in bonds, which you typically invest in to try to buffer that portfolio, you were down. There was nowhere to go. Somebody was probably thinking right now, well, we couldn't go to cash, right? I just told you, inflation was 9%. That's a guaranteed 9% loss. There is no alternatives. If, any, if we ever do something that guarantees you a 9% loss, you should fire us. <laughs> it's that simple. So the talk was, is the 60-40 portfolio done? Is it dead? Is it 60% stocks, 40% bonds, which is a traditional middle-of-the-road portfolio, which is designed to have that 40% buffer in bonds to, so you don't get crushed when the stock market's down? Is that whole concept dead? Because it didn't work this year. The reason it didn't work is there's this thing called correlation. When the stock market, the stock market zigs, does the bond market zag, or does it zig along with the stock market? Are they moving in the same direction? Correlations change over time, but historically bonds and stocks have been negatively, negatively correlated, meaning if one moves one way, the other typically moves the other way, not quite as much. The problem was we saw a huge spike in correlations as we moved into the end of 2021 into 2022. What we're seeing is really, really small. <laughs> so as correlations are starting to move back to normal ranges. We already said that the bond market is stabilizing. We think the worst of bond markets definitely in because of where the yields are. Uh, for the first time ever, I should say ever, first time this year, we were actually talking about, are we getting to that point where we start moving the bonds more? We're not there yet, but we talked about it. So we alluded to a number, number of things of why there's, from a historical perspective, reason to be a little bit, feel a little bit better about where we are right now. We talked about we have, a, we have a bear market with no recession 12 months after we hit the low, usually we're at 15.5%. Um, here's a couple other things. We'll talk about policy. Historically, Midterm election years, the first half of the year prior to the midterm, is not a good term time for the stock market. It's historically the worst period of the cycle for stocks. The good news is, once the midterm happens, there is negative two. There has never been a negative twelve month period after a midterm election. Ever. What? Ever? Oh, I'm sorry. Going back to 1950. <laughs> so I, I can't remember what the midterm is. Since going back to 1950, <laughs> we've never had a negative year. And it doesn't really matter who's in power. Either way. It doesn't matter who wins. Either way. Uh, on average, second or the 12 months following a midterm election, it's at, up average 14.5%. And those averages don't matter. If it's Republicans who take over, it's 14.8. If it's Democrats, it's 14.5. It's irrelevant. It's just coming out of the interim. Going into a midterm, it's historically bad for the power, the party in power. So there's a lot of uncertainty. We get through the midterm, we have certainty. We kind of know what the ground rules are going to be. Corporations feel better about that. They don't like uncertainty. The market does not like uncertainty. Have we 
dig down a little bit more. I mean, well, you don't have your public presence, so you can ignore this for now. Here's where we're at. If the House and Senate go from Democrat to Republican in the midterms, average return in the next 12 months, 16.3%. I think right now the odds, all the budgets, and that's probably the odds of what's going to happen. Even if it's split, we're still talking about average 12 months afterwards off 13.6%. So just where we are in the political cycle is starting to look a little bullish for the stock market. Okay. So when we talk to you and say, okay, I know you're scared, I know the market's dropping, stay the course. You don't really mean sit on your hands. You mean stick to the plan. We'll be doing the things behind the scenes to try to add value, especially after tax, uh, behind the scenes.